I was showing you for the, during the break a short video. The video was done by a Spanish artist and the video was about Isfahan and great architecture and design in Isfahan. What you have seen really, it was showing you very beautiful integration of architecture and Islamic patterns inside of the mosque. It is such important example for us. Islamic architecture blends very nicely with the art that is created and the art is filling everything. Uh, today I'm going to talk about more general topic about geometric art between East and West. I really have no idea how much time it will take. I will have probably cut it down at some stage. Uh, but let me to say something. Who am I? Uh, some people are asking me who am I? So I was born in Poland. I was educated in mathematics. Uh, then I was working in a few different places. Nicholas Copernicus University in Poland. It is my original university. Then I moved far away on the Pacific Islands. Then finally I was working in China in the Inter-University of Macau. Then I moved to Emirates and I spent 12 years in Emirates, first working at Zayed University, the only, woman, uh, the only woman university in the Middle East at this time. So my students were only women, no single men, only just the professors were men. And they were saying, we prefer to have men teaching our students, not women. Why? Because men doesn't talk about emancipation. They just talk about mathematics, physics, and chemistry. If, if a woman will be teaching from the West, she will start talking about emancipation and other things, and we don't want to do this. Then, from this, I went to the Inter, uh, New York Institute of Technology, where I spent quite a lot of time uh, teaching various of aspects of mathematics. I am interested in geometry and art connections uh, between them. Uh, here on this screen you see my last three books. The first one, Islamic Geometric Ornaments in Istanbul, is finished. And you cannot find any more, any copy. Uh, but I'm, I'm going to make another version of this book, just the second edition, probably at the end of this year. Then there was a book, Sketches on Geometry and Art between East and West. This was in Polish because I have a Polish publisher who is asking me to give him at least one book a year. And this is what is the story. So I have very easy to publish things in Polish. And the book from this year, I published in, in September, no, in June this year, Sketches on Geometry and Art, the Art of Geometric Constructions. So this is again in Polish, the same publisher, that's my work. Okay, let's look at my background. How things happening? I was living for 12 years in Emirates. Practically it was 13 years, but I'm a bit superstitious, so I, I always say 12. Uh, this was the view from my window. Every morning when I woke up, it was dark, I was opening the window, I was hearing the call for prayer from this small mosque here. Then, when there was light, I saw Abu Dhabi like this one. It's beautiful, it's just a typical desert city. Then I was walking, walking to my office. This is the way I walk through every day going to the office, just walking, not driving, not by taxi, just walking. And I saw pictures like this. This is one of the buildings on the way. Then I saw on my way a Khalifa hospital, again, beautiful Islamic art, perfectly merging with the architecture and this whole building. Then sometimes I was going to the Mazdar city and I was seeing things like this. And this is the work of Jean-Marc Castera, who was with us uh, before, the land, uh, before the lunch break. So Mazdar city 
It is a beautiful example of a very modern architecture. This is his work. Then sometimes I was going to Dubai, and in Dubai you have a few mosques which are Iranian influence. And in these mosques, I could see mokarnas like this. I could spend hours watching them, photographing them. Then I was traveling from times to China, and I saw pictures like this. This is a window in the Imperial Palace, and it is geometric art, okay? And then finally, when I am in my hometown in Poland, I see this is Nicholas Copernicus' house. It looks like this. After many times of restoration, the image is a bit, let's say, misty, but it is still geometric. Then, of course, you're getting various things in Chinese, in, uh, in Middle East, and many other places. So, this is my background. I see these things every day. My colleagues are laughing. They're saying, oh, you see geometry everywhere. And that's true. I see geometry everywhere. Uh, okay. So, what I'm going to talk about today. today. First of all, introduction. Do we see mathematics? Then I'm going to just go for a short moment to the tribal geometry and tribal art. Then I'm going to go to the Byzantine time and I'm going to talk about Roman designs. And then I'm going to spend some time in Islamic art, this topic, this topic, and this topic. I'm going to talk about Mukarnas if there will be enough time. Uh, and I hope I will be able to get to this point, which is quite important for me. And if I will be able to finish on this, it, I will be fine. So first, do, see, do we see mathematics? Everybody who is passing Nicholas Copernicus' house see things like this. My city is full of decorations of this type. What is this? This is the Gothic tracery. In fact, the Gothic tracery is in the windows, but sometimes you're getting this on the walls. And all these patterns were created with geometry. Believe me, there are very few people who will really tell you this is geometry, not many. Then you have a floor like this. This is Cosmati style floor in Italy. It is highly geometric and it is very intricate pattern. I will show you how they made it. Then you are in Islam, Sinan Pasha Mosque, and you see all these things. And you think, okay, a nice drawing. That's really geometry, okay? Then you're getting Syrian box. This is a Syrian box. You can find them a lot here in the shops with souvenirs. It is very geometric art. And here you can see clearly hexagons and triangles between them. If you connect these points here, you're getting hexagon, and these are hexagons over hexagons in hexagons. Then you are going to Korea, and so you see pattern like this one. In Korea, there's a bit of these patterns. Most of these patterns were just destroyed over the time, so you see a few of them, but still, in the private residences, you see patterns like this one here. It is geometric, and it is rather complicated pattern. So this is what you see there. That's a Zhouzhuang village near Shanghai. You have to drive about two hours from Shanghai to get to this village. That's a beautiful village full of Chinese patterns like this one. They call it Chinese lattice. There's whole range of patterns like this, and you have to just dig in them and see what you can create them. This is fragment of a doors. Can you see how beautiful is this geometry? And do you see the relation with Islamic geometry that you have here? The swastika shape you have also here in Islamic geometry, and even on the poster of this conference, you will see the swastika shape. This shows how united is the world, how the ideas from one world traveling to the other place and so on. So we have this geometric design. Look at the pavements. 
Many pavements, even here in Istanbul, they are built with geometry. And for example, here, this is Thailand. This is a Buddhist temple. And you have here symmetry. This is a mirror symmetry, left side and right side are identical. But there is more. Look at this shape. The shape of spiral, perfectly done and finished with another spiral. This is what you have here also in Turkey. If you go to any mosque, if you search for it, you will see spirals, spirals, spirals. Sometimes they are even more complicated than this one here. So, again, it is showing nations are using the same ideas to produce their own art. And that's completely different. That's a Japanese piece of art, Sangaku. This is mostly mathematics, and art is just gotten by the way. Okay? But uh, these pictures look quite artistic, but these pictures are just mathematical theorems. Okay, let's go farther. The thing started quite early. Don't think that we, the people who are going to school, learned mathematics. We were the first developing uh, geometric art. That's not true. Geometric art started a long time before people started thinking about geometry. Uh, so, for example, here. This is the Toraja tribe in Indonesia. This is the nation who came on a big boat to Indonesia from the north. And this is the front of their house. These people never learned mathematics. They never heard about the mathematics. Most of them didn't know how to write and read. But then they created mathematics that is perfectly built out of circle. Then it is perfectly made on grid, rectangular, hexagonal, and other grids. I said, these people never went to school, but they were created things like this. Some of them, some of their designs. The first one, it is just the name, Sun and Shrise. Then the second one has a name, Legendary Designer. The, thing one, the third, third one, I have no idea why they call it Dancing Alone, but the title for this design, for this pattern is Dancing Alone. And this one is buffalo, okay, it reminds buffalo. That's a geometric art of the tribe who did never did any mathematics. Then again, we are going to another tribe in Africa, the Congo. Paulus Gerdes, one of my colleagues, his Portuguese origin, he was doing research on art in tribes in Africa. And he found things that are leading to the art like this one. It is highly symmetric, but it has also different kind of symmetries in one pattern. Okay, here are examples of African art. These are mostly designs made for the fabrics. For example, these two up, they are very traditional ones, the bottom are much, much modern. But these people didn't do geometry. They just do a kind of intuitive geometry. This is Borneo Island. You see, Borneo Island, the people in Borneo Island learned how to write and read about 25, 30 years ago. They were discovered 40 years ago, okay? But they were producing art like this. It is highly sophisticated art, again with spirals, and again with mirror symmetries. This is the tribe, Iban tribe, who never went to, uh, to school at this time. They just started going to the school after the Second World War. Then you have Indonesian patterns. There's a large part of Indonesian patterns from the past, and some of them, they are floral, but they still have a kind of geometric 
a peel. For example, this one is built out of squares. There are some lines of symmetry and so on. But then, once, when the learned geometric art started, it started from ancient Greek mathematicians, it started from Pythagoras and others who were living at this time. Uh, so this is the moment when we have musical proportions based on numbers. Somebody during the lunch, somebody was asking me what I know about music and uh, mathematics. Frankly speaking, I don't know too much because I don't play on anything. Okay, I listen a lot of music, but I don't play. Okay, so this is where started the art that is based on learned geometry. And of course, we have platonic solids that are inspiration for many things later in Islam. Then we have a fake statement saying that Parthenon has a golden ratio of proportions. That's not really true, because first of all, why this bottom line is going somewhere in the middle of the steps? That's the first question. The second question is, this part of the Parthenon is missing. Do we are really sure that the top one was here? Okay. So people believe in things that want, they want to believe. But if you look, for example, into this shape here, just under the roof and above the floor, you can squeeze quite nicely two squares inside. Okay, Maybe two squares, it means uh, one to two, where the, the proportions of Parthenon, uh, but who knows this? And of course, here in Istanbul, in the archaeological museum, you can find remainings uh, from ancient times, and you have the spiral pattern interlacing like this. This is, this is where you are. Here also in Turkey, you have some ancient discoveries, and on some of the columns are such perfect spirals that it is hard to produce something like this, even with modern tools. So, the tribal art, it was not learned based on the learned mathematics. It was intuitive mathematics, but it was very mathematical. So mathematics and mathematical design is somewhere in our brains. It is hidden in our brains. Now, let's go some, to something that I promised you a moment ago. Cosmetic designs. This is, this is the type of architecture and this is the type of design that is based on Byzantine on design and is particular for Italy. You can find it in a few places outside of Italy but very few places. Uh, it was created by, by the Cosmati family. It is really one family business. The family business was living, was producing these designs in the years 1190 up to 1300, 1300. Then they disappeared, no more cosmetic design. Okay. And I said outside of Italy, you can find this surprisingly at Westminster, at the Westminster Cathedral. You can find the cosmetic design. This design has a specific name, opus sectile, cut out tech technique. Why? Because what they were doing, they were taking columns from ancient Roman temples, the big columns, they were cutting them in slices and they were using them as a material for these pieces. So they were really devastating everything uh, just to get their work done. Because of them, many old Roman temples are gone. There's no shadow out of them. And these are examples of their designs. Mostly circular designs like this one, like this one. Uh, and the feeling is also with squares, also pieces of marble just cut in sp and paste inside. You have something that you can see quite often in Islamic art, also in Byzantine art, uh, just the star, uh, 
then you have things like this, or like this, or like this. These are examples. These are examples of feeling. It is not really very precise, but their technique was just cut out something and just put it somewhere. Here are two designs, there are many more of them. We call them queen cooks. Queen cooks, it was one old coin in Roman Empire. And this shape like this one was on this coin. A queen, it means five. So it was the shape with five things. How this thing was created. Okay, let's start doing this. You see here the whole process. Take a square, divide it into four squares, inscribe circles into them, draw the diagonal and from this point you get this radius and create the smaller circle. And then what you do, you take this radius from here to here, divide it into a number of part parts, sometimes this is far five parts, sometimes it's different, and then you create a circles that are touching itself, but they are overlapping like this. The internal circle is touching with the external circle and then another intern and external circle is touching internal circle. Then you're getting things like this and when you remove all these additional drawings you get this nice shape. This was the basic design of the Queen Kungs. Then of course you have the pieces you are put, putting in so, into it and you are putting them precisely just like this, just measuring whatever you have and so on. They were quite good in these things. Another pattern from their times, guiloche. Guiloche can be two rows like this, or it can be four rows, or it can be even longer, okay, and wider. You can think whatever you want, just if you are able to connect these waves like this, you will be fine. How you create guiloche? Exactly like we create the previous pattern. Take the rectangle, plan it nicely, and then put it in a grid. You see, if you divide this into segments, you just have three segments per circle. But the circles overlapping by one segment, okay? Then you're dividing this one, you're getting this point, okay, as an intersection, you're drawing circles, then you're drawing more circles touching itself. Again, the same idea. External circles touching internal circles of the neighboring thing. And then you create things like this. That's fine, okay? When you remove all these additional lines, you're getting something like this. And finally, you're getting guiloche from the San Cesaro et Terracina. Uh, this is my work. And it is precise copy of this what you see in real work uh, world. The only thing I had to change, it is shorter. It is shorter. The original one is much longer. I just made it shorter because it is simply too much work. This thing took me about one week to, to do. So that's where. But Cosmati were also doing things in 3D. For example, here, this column, this is the whole cosmetic design. This column, you have magnified part of this column. Can you imagine the shape like this? This is highly mathematical shape. And mathematicians will tell you what is the formula for this curve in the space. In fact, you have here two curves. One is the external one, is the internal one. They call it helicoids. And Cosmatis invented these cures before nobody uh, was using them in mathematics. That's their idea. Here, you're getting design based on hexagon, inscribing in triangles shapes like this. Again, geometry, circles, and parts of the circles. Okay, let's go farther. I was showing you the Khalifa Hospital. And this is the Khalifa Hospital from outside. I was passing it every day twice. 
The Islamic character of this pattern is important. Some people were telling me it has a healing aspect. When somebody is in this hospital and when this, this person sees this pattern every day, it, is, it has a kind of calming effect on him. He can look at this, he can think that he is in a mosque, he is praying, and you have just close look of this pattern. It is popular pattern all over Abu Dhabi, all over the Emirates. You see it almost everywhere. Eh? Here it is in its full, full glory. Let's look at this, how it was created. Start with the square. The size of the square is important because the size of the square is a modulus. If you wish to fill up the fix a pattern on a space, you have to fix a number of quantities of this pattern. You cannot cut it in the middle. And so the size of this square is important. And then you have two squares like this, then you're getting additional intersections and so on. You're creating these red points and out of red points, you're getting a grid, and then you're just following lines like this, you get this pattern, and you get this pattern in such a way. The original thing was like this. This was really the design. But then, what you have, you have geometry, you have reflections or translations. This pattern was translated here, translated here, translated here. And I said, this distance A, B is important because if we have a niche like this size, we want to put a particular number of instances of this pattern. For example, here, I wanted to have four instances of the pattern. So if this is my window, I have to measure the window, I have to divide the length into four pieces exact pieces like this, and I have to create this pattern exactly one-fourth of the window. That's the same pattern, only slightly different design. Then, again, we are still in Abu Dhabi. When we had the previous discussion, Jai was telling that there are not many places in the world where Islamic art is used as a decoration for buildings. Abu Dhabi is exception. It is not a typical place in the world. This is not a typical town in the world. In Abu Dhabi, you will find a lot of patterns, Islamic patterns. You will find them in unexpected places. Very often, you see a very modern building. The building just the glass, the iron, and marble. And there's no pattern at all on the building. But then you're going inside and you're surprised because after the entrance, you're entering completely different world. You see mukarnas hanging in every corner. You see patterns on the ceiling. You have lamps that are just Islamic design and so on. So in Abu Dhabi, it is an exceptional place. You can see a lot of patterns. And there is more. They have money. They have quite a lot of money. They can buy designers from all over the world. Money doesn't matter really for them. So this is what you see here. It is a fence on one of the sheikh's villa. It is prohibited to photograph it. Okay? I got permission not from the sheikh, but from somebody from his officials to make this photograph of a few more. I was also inside behind the fence, but I didn't get permission to make photographs inside, but I could see quite a lot. Okay, let's look at this pattern from the close distance. It is a very unique pattern. Later, when I made this photograph, I went through hundreds of books, articles, and I couldn't find a copy of this pattern anywhere else. So I asked them, how you got this pattern? And they told me, listen, a sheikh was looking on its own 
for a unique pattern that will be nowhere else. This was the idea, to have the pattern that will be nowhere in any other place. And the pattern is really unique. How it was created, you have the idea. If you start from this star, if you go down to the level of this star, if you create this rectangle, then by mathematical operation symmetry, the mirror symmetry, you will be able to create the whole pattern. So the essential part of this pattern is just this rectangle. And this rectangle is just the key for everything. How they established these points? Just dividing this distance into five pieces. From here to here you have two pieces, from here to here you have one piece, and from here to here you have two pieces. That's the secret of this design. The rest is simple, okay? The rest looks like this. So you can, you can create you can create a thing like this on your own, that you, then you merge this thing with the rest of the pattern. The rosette, the 12 fold rosette that was made there, it is not unique, it is very popular in many places you can find it. This is the 12 fold rosette, and then you're getting the fence thing just this way. Like I said, dividing this distance into five pieces, this is one of them. You're putting the rosette just attached to one of the points. Then from the other end, you're doing this. And then you're filling the space between the two rosettes. You see, very often, people are looking at the rosettes and saying, okay, that's a beautiful. It is beautiful, but the key is what you're getting between rosettes. The space between rosettes is occupying such an important place. It is somewhere out, okay? But to feel it perfectly fine is really art, and this is the difficult part. It is not difficult to create this rosette. It is difficult to feel the space behind it. And then you have this pattern uh, from the shake fence, but you can make it colorful if you wish, and you can, you, you can use any colors you prefer, or any colors that are good for the particular, particular part of the world. Okay, let's go to Shekhzade. You know this mosque? This is my favorite place here in Istanbul. And believe me, every time when I'm here, my first steps, my very first steps are to the Shekhzade mosque. So when I came this time, I came left, late, late afternoon, and despite of this, that I was tired and so on, I just walked there, okay? I always walk, this is another story. This beautiful mosque has a lot of interesting things. It is built on two squares. It is built on very nice geometry. There's no, no time to talk about this geometry. I wish to stay on the courtyard at the moment and something like this. Did you see this pattern in, the, in this mosque? I call it charming stars ornament. Charming because they are different than normally the stars and they have some their own charm. I like this pattern very much. I made so many photographs of them and I still wonder why I'm doing this because I have photographed them in every type of light. How this is done? I just it was done by this way. You have here just the main major area idea how this pattern was done. Again, constructing construction, geometric construction, geometric construction. You can find this pattern about in my book about Islamic ornaments in Istanbul. This this book disappeared a long time ago, but I am planning to make a new book for Islamic patterns in Istanbul. And surprisingly, before coming here, I got the publisher who wants to publish it. So that's fine. So that's, that's the idea for the charming pattern in Istanbul, in uh, Sheikhs at the mosque. There are other patterns in this mosque, but I just don't want to go through them. 
Okay, let's go to something different. Very often we see something that is hanging, hanging somewhere under the ceiling. So I just call it blocks under the ceiling. That's a modern design, a typical for Abu Dhabi. One of the shopping malls has something like this. Uh, it is huge. First of all, it is huge on the picture. It doesn't look huge, but these blocks are one meter by one meter. Okay, but this is not really important. Here in Istanbul, you see mokarnas like this. Why we have mokarnas, really? This is the way of filling a space somewhere in the corner, especially in the mosque, where you have rectangular space, then on top of this you have hexagon or octagon or round something, and then in the corner, of this rectangular space, there's something missing. So putting this mukarnas there, it is a good idea to fill the space in such a way that it will be just combining Islamic art and it will be combining architecture together. This is how it looks from the bottom. This is mukarnas somewhere in Alhambra. It is very sophisticated. If you look at Mukarnas from the simplest point of view, you can just think about this. This is something built out of shapes. You can make wooden blocks like this. And the particular place, uh, shapes are like this, like this, like this, okay? You can make even a plan of each of them. So this one, it will be this. The red dot means this leg going out. This one, means this one. Again, the leg is for the dot. Then you have one like this, uh, where you have two legs, okay? And in this right corner, there's nothing. Then you have also things like this. I didn't make them here, because I didn't want to make things more complicated. So suppose that we have these pieces. Can we make our own mukarnas? Is this very difficult? Not especially. You have to make your plan. Just a plan, like the plan of the building, plan of something. So that's the plan of one of the Mokarnas in, uh, here in Istanbul. Okay, but here is a plan of very simple Mokarnas from Morocco. I choose this one because it contains very few shapes and I just wish to see how it can be done. What I will be doing, I will be doing it in layers. Front layer, middle layer, and the back layer. So when you take a front layer, it is like this. I made a gap here because I wanted you to see where is the break. Uh, so these two pieces here are here and here. Then this piece here, it is this. This piece here, this brown, it is this. Then again, you have this part that is here then you have this part that is here, and then you have this one, one-legged here thing. That's the whole thing, how you assemble your simple mokarnas. You can make it from practically any kind of piece of wood and make it. This is the same thing looking from the back. I said I made the gap here deliberately to show that it is connected here. So this is from the back. The legs are just marked here. Then you're putting something on top because you see, I left here quite a lot of gaps here. Uh, so you have to fill this space above. When you fill the space, you can build another layer, the middle layer, and then you can build the back layer. Uh, so you have all these layers, and this is how the mokarnas are built. Very simple mokarnas based on rectangular shapes, on square shapes, really. You can make it on your own. And there's not much literature about Mokarnas. Uh, I think there is one nice chapter in Jean-Marc book, and there's one website talking about Mokarnas, that's all. And I think Mokarnas need a lot of research. And then when you have your Mokarnas, you can paint it like this, this is Istanbul. 
the painted mukarnas here in Istanbul. It is beautiful, and of course you have to remember. And the real mukarnas in Istanbul use many more shapes than I used them there. I was showing you this video, and I was showing this video deliberately. In this video, you will see a fountain with such an interlaced pattern here. It is nice. Construction of this pattern is incredibly complicated. So, I don't wish to show the Isfahan animation, because you have seen it. That's the pattern from the close distance, and here is the rule how the pattern was created. Again, take a square, divide into four equal parts, inscribe circles. This is what I was showing you already a few times. Then, build internal circle like this. And then, you start making circles out of circles, okay? And things are getting more complicated than I can describe it now. I don't have much time. But slowly, when you start making the lines much stronger, you will see how the pattern will come, okay? So that's how the patterns like this are created. Okay, and now I am at home. Gothic tracery. If you remember last workshop from the last year, somebody said, maybe we should talk about Gothic arts also. So I will talk for a brief moment about Gothic tracery and Gothic art. Why it is important? You see, these are two different worlds. On one side, you have Islamic world, and you have the art with segments. Most of the Islamic art is built out of segments. When you're talking to the Gothic art, you will see circles, 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 circles. You can find in both areas designs that share the same features. They are not totally disconnected. But Gothic tracery is built out of circles, and it is getting very complicated, especially when you go to UK, and if you can see the typical design uh, of the English Gothic tracery. Just a short example. The Copernicus house, I was telling you a few times, one, the most important thing you have to remember when you talk about Gothic art is the Euclid, book number three, theorem 11 and 12. If you have two touching circles, then the line passing through their centers is passing through the place of connection. That's the same. Two touching circles, these were touching internally, these are touching externally, the line passing through the centers of these two circles is passing through the touching point. This is the key theorem in Gothic art. If you remember this, you're getting Gothic art uh, reasonably easy. So, for example, a shape like this. A shape like this is called tree leaf because the, it has three leaves. Three leaves inscribed in a circle. How you made them? Here's the whole construction, okay? And you have three leaves, you can inscribe three leaves inside of three leaves, you can build even more complicated and more complicated and more complicated. This is where the Gothic tracery goes. I am showing you elements of Gothic tracery. I am not showing you the full designs because it is too complicated just for five minutes of talking. Here is another version of a tree leaf. Circle, make three, make an equilateral triangle, draw these lines through the center, through the middle points of each side, okay, and then draw from these points circles touching here, and they will be going somewhere here. Then whatever you got, you just have to make thinner, uh, take these lines, you're getting a shape like this. You're getting three leaves inscribed in such a curvilinear triangle. 
That's a typical motif for the Gothic tracery. Then you have four leaves. They call it four fish bladers. You know, I'm not sure. You're buying fish in the supermarket and you don't, you don't look inside. But in older times, when you were going on the river, you were catching the fish, you had then cut it down, you can remove everything from inside. There was something that, was, that had a shape like this. Okay? They, it, it is called fish blader. It is transparent thing with air inside, and because of this, the fish can swim. And in Gothic art, you have shapes like this, inscribed in circles, and of course, you can construct them in such a way that you can make them more complicated, like this. And here are the elements of Gothic art. This is what you're getting on these things. Okay, and let, let me to finish everything. In modern times, many people are using these inspirations. This is, you know this person, M.C. Escher. M.C. Escher, mathematicians are saying, no, he was not mathematician, he was artist. An artist saying, he was not artist, he was mathematician. Okay, and no one really is able to admit he was artist and he was mathematician at the same time. His inspiration was in Alhambra. His inspiration was in Islamic art. But he was doing also mathematical things like this one. This is the Mebius curve, and it's a very good example of a Mebius, Mebius curve for the high school students. These are tessellations with, with the hyperbolic geometry. Okay, Here, hyperbolic geometry applied in such a way. That's mathematics combined with art. That's a modern inspiration, uh, Lego blocks, and you can find it in, on this website. If you go to Holland, you can probably see design like this. This is just the Escher style design. You can see also in uh, Holland shapes like this. In USA, probably also you can find quite a number of shapes like this. This is again art combined with geometry. But in modern places, in modern restaurants, very often you see shapes like this that are based on a very simple geometry. You see them. You see them here in Istanbul, you see them in Beijing, and you see them in Seoul. That's another, this is just a coffee shop. And you have Islamic pattern baseline like this. But this is not only Islamic, this is also Chinese pattern. It is used all over the cultures. Here, there's something that is very nice, the Cairo tiling. If you look at this, you will find surprisingly that this tiling is made out of pentagons, out of equilateral pentagons. The only thing is that the sides of these pentagons are equal, but the angles are not. And this is the key to this design. Very modern design using ideas that we also find in Islamic art. And this is something modern, uh, but this is out of the business. And I wish to thank you in this moment, and I think I just got exactly on time.